formed more than 100 years ago. So a very special time in the party's history and uh, certainly in current history. I think it's a watershed moment, some people have described it, in terms of uh, policies that need to be put into place. We find ourselves in a, a world that's uh, struggling economically and uh, that of course affects South Africa as well. So real policy issues need to be discussed. Uh, but to help us set up this uh, conference, uh, joined today by the ANC Secretary General, uh, Comrade Gwede Mantashe, and also ANC NEC member, uh, Comrade Jeff Khadebe. Right, just before the break, uh, I asked you, has the ANC leadership lost some control then over its members if they're finding themselves going to court rather than listening to NEC decisions about some of the disagreements taking place in the party? Not at all. The ANC is in full control of its members and also is running this country as the best government that South Africa has ever had. The SG has indicated that uh, since 2007, we have increased our membership. Now we stand at 1.2 million members, mm. card-carrying members in good standing. That's a decision that was taken more than 60 years ago in 1942 National Conference, where the ANC aspired to have 1 million members. It is under President Zuma, as the president of the ANC, that we have been able to attain that 1 million members and more. So that's... That is not a reflection of an organization that is not in control. If you look at those uh, rotten apples who do not understand that the ANC is a voluntary association of members, you must utilize the structures within the organization to resolve whatever challenges that they are. We've got uh, appropriate structures, including DC structures, uh, leadership at all levels to deal with all problems. And as you know, Almost all those uh, so-called comrades who have taken the ANC to court, none of them have ever won in a court of law. Because even the courts, they understand that an organization such as the ANC is a, a voluntary association. The last outstanding issue is from here in Free State. We are waiting at 10 o'clock to hear what the Constitutional oh, Court will say. But there is a standing decision of the ANC that those who take the ANC to court they have uh, expelled themselves. Yeah. The, the president. <laughs> yeah. 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 I want to add one thing that taking the NC to court is a right that has been acquired by members of the NC. But there is a strange trend in this case. Yeah. Of the 16 cases that have gone to court, one advocate goes to that court. Yeah. And, and to me, to me, let me tell you what I read out of that, is that you have some uh, association that sits in a corner with this one advocate to look for every witness that they can possibly find and take the NC to court. It's a trend that we may, we're, we're analyzing, we're looking at. I can tell you that we'll get the outcome of the Concord today. That same advocate will be in Mafeking uh, in the case of the Northwest, people who say they are disgruntled. Oh, so, um, Jeremy. That, that, that <laughs> means that it's not spontaneous. Yeah. Once it happens that way, it's not spontaneous. It's organized it chaos. It is organized chaos. All right, so are, you, so are you saying that you agree then with uh, Jeremy Cronin, who said this week that there's a campaign to divide the ANC, a concerted campaign? Well, you can see the signs are all there. Uh, the media leaks, not even leaks. We, we have a view that there are some members, even at leadership level, who brief the media about what, what goes on, especially in the meetings of the National Executive Committee. That is why we are saying that this conference, Future Generation, must see it as a watershed conference so that you can be able to deal decisively with all those elements who are bringing the ANC into serious disrepute. Okay, so uh, state of the tripartite alliance, is that going to come up during conversation? Because that's something that's also, I don't know, I get a sense there's something bubbling under. Um, we heard the Deputy Minister of Higher Education, Manana, saying that Vavi is a problem child in the alliance. Um, so I'm just wondering, when I hear statements like that, what is the state of affairs? No, the, 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 the reality of the matter is that only when a member of the ANC or a member of the Alliance Partners 
understand the character of the alliance, we will appreciate to deal with, with the differences. Mm -hmm. That it is an inter-class alliance. It's a liberation movement, which is a multi-class and a, a movement in alliance with two working class formations. Now, to, to agree on the National Democratic Revolution as the basic program, that program is a minimum program. But the party and COSADU do not lose their class orientation and ideological outlook when they come to the alliance. They don't melt into the alliance. That's why from time to time, you will pick up that impatience because they represent a, a, a particular constituency, the working class, which of the time will feel that we are getting a raw deal. And therefore, that impatience reflects in the last uh, relations. It requires a mature ANC as a leader of that alliance to manage the dynamics of the alliance. Mm -hmm. So when, when, when uh, Vavi, as the general secretary of, of, the, of, of COSATU, appears to be impatient with e tolling or the labor brokers, we should understand that he talks from a particular viewpoint representing a particular class. And this leader of the alliance, the African National Congress, mm -hmm. must manage those relations. That's why even when they go to court, we'll deal with them in court, still engage them politically so that they must understand and see what the ANC is doing. What is the long-term objective? Is it all, maybe it's painful to pay, but it is also important for the country to have world-class infrastructure. Then the ANC must reconcile those interests. And the, the, the other interest groups mm. will be uncomfortable with one aspect, the other will be uncomfortable with the other. Okay. Um, we're going to go to the tables now, but perhaps just one point um, I could ask you. This leadership race seems to have been quite hot this year, very well contested, or maybe it's in the media space, I don't know. But I'm just wondering, um, you talk about slates and you don't want to talk about slates, they exist, they don't exist. Are there going to be political consequences for the losing candidates in the top six? Because if I go back to Polokwane, I think the AU Commission chair is the only one that's left standing. No. Yeah? No. Okay. No, you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you're wrong, you're wrong. <laughs> you're wrong. Yeah. Uh, I, I want you to go yes. and do your homework. Okay. Take the cabinet right. and check in that cabinet how many supported the third term. Okay. You'll find more than 10. All right. I can tell you that uh, because we know in detail and we took a conscious decision that nobody will be prosecuted because he or she made a choice in a conference of the ANC. Right. That will continue after this conference. What about the top six themselves, the losing candidates? Where are they now? Well, uh, it's the delegates that decides who must be in the leadership of the organization. Yeah. No one can be crucified for standing for any position of the ANC, including the top six position. Mm -hmm. That's what democracy is. But also, people must also accept that uh, when the branches of the ANC have spoken, we need to live by that decision as well. But can I, can yes. I add one thing? Yes, yeah. let, let me just add one thing. Don't add those who walked away. Okay. Those who walked away, broke off from the ANC, ran for cover. <laughs> many of them are running coming a, back. They are running, <laughs> many of them are coming back, and others are running a party that has not held a conference in five years. <laughs> Okay. All right, let's, let's take it to the tables. Let's find out uh, what's on your mind. Uh, we begin on table number 26, uh, that uh, Toli Kanyile. Table number 26. Morning. Uh, my question is directed to Minister Adebi. Minister, I've got two questions. The first one is... Uh, it's about national wealth. How do we ensure as a country moving forward to the second phase or second transaction, how do we ensure that the national wealth is distributed to most of the people instead of a few? The second one is on corruption. You've already touched on the issue of corruption. There are a number of institutions uh, that are now fighting corruption. And uh, if you look at the states, they are fighting it quite successfully. 
uh, in the SCCU, where we are focusing on corruption and theft, uh, you'll see that our conviction rate is even higher than 80%. But when you look in, in the perception index, perceptions index, you see that our ranking is going down. Within a year, we have gone down from 64 to 69. Uh, what do you think uh, we really need to do to ensure that the perception of South Africa as a country really when it comes to fighting corruption uh, it looks good and we go up instead of going down? Thank you. Well, I think the most important thing to start with the last issue on corruption is that there is a firm political commitment not only from the ANC but from its government to deal with corruption decisively. If you look in the past five years, we have left no stone unturned in ensuring that wherever corruption rears its ugly head and whoever is involved, the law enforcement agencies must take its toll. If you look at cabinet, there is an anti-corruption task team, cabinet committee, which is chaired by the minister and the presidency, Collins Chabane. We have created structures within the Department of Public Service and Administration to ensure that those officials who are found to be corrupt within the public service are dealt with decisively. We have also a series of anti-corruption measures within law enforcement agencies, such as the creation of the HOCS, the, the Special Investigative Unit, and all those are indicative of the seriousness with which uh, our country and the ANC is taking this issue. But the fight against corruption cannot be achieved if government works on its own. It is a responsibility of all members of South African society to join hands with government because the perception that uh, the, the government that is corrupt is actually not accurate because it always takes two to tango. There is a corrupter and a corruptee, both from the public service, public sector, as well as in the private uh, sector. So all those initiatives are very important that uh, we leave no stone unturned in uprooting corruption from, the, from South Africa. Uh, looking at the perceptions in general, it is because of our transparency as a nation, we have always reported corruption. In fact, the majority of cases that you read about in the media is because of the uncovering of that corruption by the ANC and this government in particular. On the issue of national wealth, as I've indicated when we started uh, this conversation this morning, that the issue of the economy is at the center of this uh, ANC conference that is starting on Sunday. Already, if you recall, in uh, 2010 at the NGC, there was a, a task team, that a decision that was taken that we need to look at this issue of the mines in, in, in South Africa, in particular the issue that uh, is very <laughs> in the lips of many South Africans about the nationalization and the role of the state. And we're very clear about that as we're going to Mangawung, that the role of the state is very important because our main policy position is that of a mixed economy where there must be a combination of the role of the state as well as the private sector. But in this particular is that we cannot do things as usual. We need to move into a new gear to introduce radical economic uh, transformation policies that must ensure that the structure of the, of the South African economy changes to reflect the demographics of our country. We cannot be happy to see that in the Johannesburg Stock Exchange there's just a negligible uh, shareholders who are black and in particular white. So that issue going forward will be determining the ANC in order to attain this economic freedom that all of us are yearning for. So the issue of national wealth must be belonging to the people of South Africa as a whole. You wanted to answer me? Just one thing that I want to add is that uh, we must not resent uh, uh, the redistribution of wealth when there are emergence of black wealthy individuals. Sometimes it comes out as if we resent that. We should encourage it because that's why the, the, the numbers that are published in the mm. top 100 richest people are very important. There was nothing. Then they became two. In the last list, there were 29 blacks in that list. Mm. Now, always we, we, we look at that. It, it means there are few. 29 is few. But we must also do analysis of the black middle class bulge. 
because that black middle class bulge reflects the redistribution of wealth and professional uh, operational uh, exposure. And all those issues, I think that should work. The, the last thing I want to raise is that maybe researchers must do a detailed scientific research on the capital formation post-independence in South Africa. Yeah. I don't think we've done that. We're talking about this thing loosely, that there are few and so forth, but we have not done analysis of capital formation post-independence. That includes the ability of the country to begin to say, why is there big clamor for emerging entrepreneurs to do business with, with government? And very little happening in the private sector because that reflects distortion. Uh, that's why you will talk of entrepreneurs. When you talk, we must talk of entrepreneurs, it's not, it's, it's, it's bad and, and also reflect the intention and the role played by government. The private sector must come to the party, it must contribute in the capital formation in the country. Okay. Comrade Jeff, you said earlier on uh, that the public need to participate in the process of exposing corruption. But aren't you making it difficult for them with the secrecy bill? There is no secrecy bill in South Africa. We are a very transparent country, yeah. more than many <laughs> democracies mm. in the world. So this notion that there is a secrecy bill is actually false. It's a protection of state information bill. Mm. You just name any country in the world that does not protect state information. But people are worried about some of the uh, lines in the legislation that's proposed that whistleblowers could expose themselves. Not uh, at all. In the Department of Justice, mm -hmm. through the National Prosecuting Authority, we have a whole infrastructure of protecting those whistleblowers. They are, they are protected, mm -hmm. they are put in safe houses, so there is no intimidation whatsoever. There are many cases that the state has succeeded because of those whistleblowers mm -hmm. and who are part of this witness protection program. So that is covered in the legislation. There is an infrastructure to deal with that in particular. Okay, all right, table number eight, Mondli Mvambi. Thank you very much, good morning. Uh, my name is Mondli Mvambi, generously working for the First State Provincial Government. Uh, the Watershed Conference, uh, I, I, I hear little uh, emphasis on the protection of the environment. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, environmental degradation that is going on. Uh, globally, there's an impasse around uh, uh, protection of the environment. So I, I'd like to hear uh, some of the policy shifts that are going to, to, uh, to be taken in this conference to ensure that we protect the environment. Thank you. Okay. No, uh, I think before we come to that point, it will be interesting for people to go back to the 52nd National Conference and go in details of the resolution on climate change. On climate change. As a result of that resolution, we have been doing a number of things to, to actually contribute to that, including a revisiting the energy source mix in South Africa, moving slightly from coal to other sources, including renewables. That is a function and outcome of a resolution that is in place. We had the conference in Durban on climate change. Uh, it's going to Mexico now. Is it going to Mexico? Yeah. Oh, yes, I think it's in Doha. It's not, COP, yeah. COP 18. It yeah. was in yeah. Doha. All those processes were actively involved in those processes. So the point I'm making is that before we talk about major policy shift, we must, uh, we must look into what is it that we have put in place, what we have been doing, how far have we gone, and far we are concerned, we are making a lot of progress. I can tell you that as a, as a coal miner, where every time people say reduce coal, I always think about, hey, coal mining will come down. We have reached the point of coal mining. But we have committed ourselves to change the energy mix in South Africa. That commitment is unconditional. And we're going to do it. That's why we talk of and begin to say, what can we do in nuclear? 
What can you do in renewables? And that there are quantities put in place that will spend so much on renewables. But what we should also look into is to look into the, 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 the cost of the various sources of energy. Because the country sometimes we close our eyes to that and say, uh, IPP sell to ESCOM uh, irrespective of the cost. You generate uh, some units at 3 rand 50 but sell them at 49 cents, it doesn't make economic sense. There must be a debate about moving to more renewables, but also pay attention to the cost of generating energy. We can't just move irrespective. And in fact, uh, the Minister of Energy, I think uh, about a month ago, he announced uh, big uh, tenders for renewables. I think it cost to about four multi-billion rand uh, contracts. Okay. As a reflection of this, uh, uh, ensuring that the environment is protected in South Africa. Okay. Table 16. I can't quite read your surname here. Uh, Kondile, if you could stand up and say your full name so that we can recognize you. No, thanks, but it's okay. me. Right. Uh, Kondile <laughs> Kedama. Uh, oh, okay. SG uh, and the leadership. Uh, my question is just around the building towards the Mangaung Conference here. Uh, Peter, I, we have seen a negative uh, coverage towards the Mangaung conference. Is this Mar in the media? Yes. Okay. Much linking of leadership, uh, funny comments, and all that. And uh, Chair, I must say that I don't know whether there's a need of radical surgery for the media in South Africa, or is the media's intention to divide the, the ANC, and I want to know what is the ANC doing? But also, I want to know who is actually on the other side, because if, there's a, if the media says there's a crisis in the ANC, who is saying there's a crisis in the media on the other side? Thanks. Okay. <laughs> well, I think uh, the media must uh, have its own self-reflection of how they report because the majority of uh, what they is being reported about is not what happens in the ordinary branch of the ANC. There are vibrant debates that take place there, but as they say, uh, why, why spoil a good story with, with true facts? Mm. That's what we hear journalists say. But I can assure you that, uh, broadly speaking, the branches of the ANC, as the SG has said, have run good BGMs that get good policy discussion documents, and they also have vibrant uh, discussions and even uh, leadership contest uh, in the branches, but that has not brought about the ANC into disrepute. But it's when personalities are involved that we find an exaggeration of all those facts. Are we saying that they are printing and reporting untruths, or are they just focusing on things that might be unflattering to the ANC? No, I, I think the, the disadvantage is when the media uh, put a lot of emphasis on sensation, and then say sensation sells newspapers. Then when they do that, you, you read respectable uh, News, newspapers, and you can see that there's a drift towards a uh, tabloid mm -hmm. approach of reporting. And, 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 and tabloid reporting is about sensation. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have run uh, 12 uh, provincial conferences and there are problems in two, the 10 do not matter. You will report on the two. Uh, if you go to the ANC conference and there's a problem in a province, and they will say there is likely to be blood on the floor in the ANC National Conference. And when there is no blood on the floor, this, the storyline changes. That, yeah, there was management, stage management of the conference. That is what we have been subjected to all the time. Okay, let, me ask let, let me be bolder on this issue. Yeah. To say, if you read the papers the past two months, mm. you would have thought that... Uh, President Zuma, for example, has no support within the structures of the ANC. That's what the media tells you. But when you look at the results of the PGCs of the ANC, majority of them is a different story. The concerted effort that you see in the media attacking the president every hour, 
is a reflection of this disjointed view about the ANC as if the ANC is fighting amongst themselves. Many so that's, that's the point that we are highlighting, that uh, we, we don't want praise singers for yeah. the ANC or the president, but there must be fair reporting Truth. of what is happening. Let me ask you this then. So if the media generally is tabloidizing, is it applying that same principle of being tabloid across all the parties, or do you think that the ANC is being singled out more than the other, two, other, other parties? Uh, the ANC is being singled out. Uh, because we are a major party, we are a leading party in South Africa, we are a big party, we are everywhere. And therefore the media will focus on us. Uh, when there is a conference of an opposition party uh, two, two weeks ago, it will be news for two days. When there is a conference of the ANC, it's news for months, because, because that's what the ANC is. But when you want to, 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 to delegitimize the ANC, you'll see many things. Let me refer to what happened during this week, where you begin to see adverts of business, a business being unashamedly, and the clergy unashamedly saying, we want to see change of leadership. We will never, never venture into saying to any church, we don't like that, that bishop, we think we must uh, be given an, an opportunity. Uh, to appoint a bishop for you. We'll never venture doing that. We are an organization. All we have been appealing for is that please give us space to be an organization. Okay. So, so what about the ANC and forces sympathetic to the ANC setting up their own media to counter this, attract this? Well, it's a, it's a long standing decision of the ANC that the ANC must have its own media. Yeah. But I'm sure the issue of resources uh, plays a very critical role mm. in realizing that objective. I okay. think in many countries, uh, if you go to Britain, you will know that the Sunday Times, they yeah. support yeah. which part and so on. But in South Africa, we are told that uh, we should not be involved in this. Okay. That is why uh, we, we support uh, organizations such as the New Age that yeah. have a different perspective in reporting about what government is doing, mm -hmm. not that they're becoming the mouthpiece of the ANC or if, of his government, but to report fairly in a transparent manner as to what is being achieved in South Africa, not okay. this negativity that we read, we read every day. All right, so okay, you talked about the clergy. We've got a clergyman here. Reverend Zondo would like to uh, pose a question. Uh, Reverend? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, he's standing up. He's in, they, they just want to pick up your camera there. Over here. There we go. Okay. Number one. Uh, next year is, is 2030. It will be almost 100 years. I'm up on that When are we going to get Umsaba back to the people? And then, number two, I want to say, I, 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 I stated to wish the ANC a successful and a peaceful conference, German Fundus, as pastors. And we, we pray that the delegate must come back with the policies that will enhance the development in our own country in South Africa. I thank you. Okay. <laughs> well, on the issue of the land question, that's top of the agenda of this uh, conference, as you also noticed at the policy conference in June, and already the Department of Rural Development and Land Reform under Comrade Kukil and Quinty is busy at work ensuring that they create structures that will ensure that this redistribution of land for public purpose, for agriculture, or for industrial purposes must happen, that people who till the land must be able to own it. So we're happy to indicate that uh, already uh, Minister Nguinti has already established a committee to establish this land uh, uh, value which will be responsible for ensuring that we get fair value for money when we buy land as the state, not this uh, willing seller, willing buyer, which has uh, uh, inflated prices in South Africa and has cost a lot into the fiscals. Mm -hmm. So we believe that uh, 2013 we're going to make major strides in ensuring 
that uh, this rural development and land reform is uh, accelerated so that our people can be able to till the land. Mm -hmm. If coupled with that as well, there is a massive uh, infrastructure rollout program that is not only geared towards the urban areas, but also in rural areas so that uh, we need to develop those economies in rural areas so that this internal migration from the rural areas into the urban city can be mitigated against. So we're very confident that uh, we have a handle of this issue now, that once and for all we can deal with this land question so that we can be able to ensure that our people can benefit out of the land that they till. Talking about policy, um, one gets a sense that everyone's been waiting for Mangaung. Uh, they kind of, whether it's an international audience, domestic audience, are we going to have clarity on all the issues after this conference, whether it's nationalization, land reform, uh, business policies, taxation, all of those issues, are we going to have some clarity that people can say, okay, I can take a breath now, it's all clear, I can now start to take action? No. Um, you see, land, mm. we'll have two aspects. Let me start with land. The first one will be a distribution of land rural development and all that. But there's one thing that should be strengthened. Keenness of black farmers to become farmers. You don't become a farmer by being a spectator. You become a farmer by farming. Mm -hmm. Then there must be keenness on our part to be farmers. And must get in there, work hard for it, earn it. Unfortunately, farming is like mining. Mm -hmm. You front load capital, uh, you, you break even much later down the line and begin to make money very late in the process. And we must be very patient about that because one of the things that will hamper progress is when you have weekend farmers who go and spend a weekend for a bry in a farm and make that, that farm not to be productive. Mm -hmm. We must talk about food production, food security, link it to land redistribution. That emphasis is going to come through in the conference because as we give our people access to, 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 to land, there must be also commitment to continue improving production. And it will require at policy level support uh, mechanisms and the, the question of training of those farmers. Let's leave that. Clarity. You see, uh, one journalist was asking me during the week, yeah, you have been downgraded because there's uncertainty. And I said, uh, if the, the rating agencies uh, want to influence the outcome of a conference, then it's going to be a problem because there's going to be a conference again in 2017. And again, there will be another one in 2022. Mm -hmm. We'll have a conference every five years as the ANC. And every time we go to a conference, there will be policy discussion. It is not uncertainty. There are policies in place, and those policies remain in place until new policies get adopted. Out of this conference will adopt policies. Those policies will bring about certainty. What came out of the post conference are recommendations to this conference. Everything that passes the test of this national conference will become policy of the ANC. Okay, talking about policy, and uh, you've, you've mentioned uh, agriculture. We saw Marikana and the whole issue of labor. And these are the grassroots, these are people who are going to vote for you. Are we going to see in this discussion something about realistic minimum wages? Because I've been hearing this disparity between minimum wage and what is a living wage, and that there's a gap. Are we going to get a, a realistic minimum wage being discussed? Well, uh, it's for the conference delegates to, mm. to discuss. But uh, from, from the government's perspective, I think we're making strides through the Department of Labor mm. to encourage the pri private sector to pay workers living wage so that they can be able to feed their families. Whenever the issues uh, of uh, unrest happens, for example, the disturbances that have taken place in the Western Cape, people forget that uh, some of those workers are getting slavery wages how, who can live on 30 runs a, a, a month to start with. So it is the responsibility also of the private sector to come to the party to ensure that they are also part and parcel of job creation in our country, but more particularly to pay our people a living wage. Okay, table number three. 
Uh, all right, I'm not quite sure. It says on behalf of a youngster. Table number three. Who's table number three? <laughs> table number three is here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm not the youngster. Oh, okay. <laughs> you do look young, though, I must say. <laughs> Animated youngster who said, why is the ANC spending so much money on the conference? The issue actually wasn't why the ANC was spending money, so much money on the conference. This youngster thought that the money that uh, the ANC is spending is coming from government coffers. I was able to answer that question, but I think that it's important for the SG in particular to clarify th this question, because there's many out there who are thinking that this conference, the money that's being spent, is uh, coming from government coffers. Thank you. No. Uh, the, the ANC conference is not funded by the state. At all. Mm -hmm. At all. We do fundraising, we, we, we pester business people here to help us uh, foot the bill for that, on mm -hmm. that, on that. And many of them get so uh, worried that we go to them today and say, but what you gave us is not sufficient, can you give us more? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and many of them give us, next time they say, no, we've been giving you too much. <laughs> we are raising funds for ANC uh, conferences. Even tomorrow there's yeah. a Galatina fundraising yeah. for the that conference. That Galatina is fundraising. Yeah. But the reality of the matter is that we pay for our conferences. We pay for our conferences. We are not paid for by government. That is clear. And therefore, we are not taking money that should go to a youth wage subsidy and spend it in conference. It is not government money. It is ANC money. We battle to foot that bill. It's heavy, but we must have a decent conference of the African National Congress. So when I, when I was a mine worker, one thing we learned was that only the best for mine workers. We say so for, yeah. for, for, for ANC members, only the best for ANC members. Then we come out after the conference and deal with the overdraft. What do we do with that overdraft? But we'll run a good conference for ANC members. That's what we do. Okay, all right. Um, I'm going to start looking at our Twitter pages as well. But let's in the meantime go to table number five, and it's Kaiser Kosa. Thank you, um, Kaiser Koza from the Black Management Forum. Um, to, to, to both uh, panelists, we, we have a dual system in education. There's a private education for the haves, there's a public education for the have-nots. Same happens in health, it's now creeping into safety and security. Will this policy be dealing with that so that we, we don't have uh, this perpetuation of inequality? Um, especially in education, SG, you, you said, yes, there are certain strides that have been made, and we acknowledge that. But when you look at implementation, and I happen to work around school education assisting uh, a school back in Harris Mead at Vulindlela, the, the parents blame the teachers. The teachers blame government. Um, so, 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 you know, there's a blame game happening around education. And, and, and most of the people around the table um, I would say we wouldn't necessarily want to see our kids in public education. Instead, we, we see them in private education. Will this policy be dealing with that um, in terms of implementation and the lack thereof, and the role that unions, and in particular SATU, plays around education in the public education system? The, I think the responsibility of government is to ensure that there is good public education. That is the primary role. And you are not going to get that by uh, trying to kill private education. Private education, it has been there. Missionaries at schools. You'll find various denominations, Maria Zell, Marian Hill, uh, Adams College, Lovedale. Those were missionaries. You mean school, Oshange. Yes, Oshange. <laughs> All those were, 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 were missionary schools, producing good students and good graduates who became leaders of the country. But what is important is that the state must invest in continuous improvement of public ed uh, education. Now, the, the, the beauty of it is that public education produced the bulk of the students. It happens today. That's why when we talk of in the increase of numbers who go to every colleges and universities, big chunk of those students come out of public education. 
Others will say, yeah, it is Model C schools, but the numbers tell a different story. Model C schools, which are public schools, by the way, uh, we should never want to wish them away because they happen to, to be Model C schools. Actually, many of them today will find a majority of them having a majority of those kids being black children going to those schools. And we must never resent that, but we must invest in schools in township and rural areas so that they come to the same level as any other school, create infrastructure, because one of the things that is not in those schools is the infrastructure, classrooms, sports fields, laboratories, libraries. If we can invest in that, we'll improve. But we are comfortable with the progress we're making in improving the quality of education at that level. As I said, the biggest worry as we sit here now is that we are lagging behind in math and science. In other areas, we are catching up. What a young, many people don't forget that what a young democracy from a system where there were four education systems. You see, I think if, we, if one reads the census 2011 report, you will see the picture. It creates a clear, realistic picture of the movement from the bottom, from bandu education and closing the gap almost to equal education. That progress, we're quantifying, we're looking at it because we're refusing as a party to be impacted upon by effects of recency. Only look on today without tracing the historic development and evolution in any aspect of life. The other coin in the question about health, it is for that reason that uh, we are introducing the Nash insurance mm -hmm. in order to ensure that no South African can, can die with, when, when he doesn't have money to pay for, for health services. There's a tragedy that happened about two weeks ago where a youngster was refused entry into a private hospital because he doesn't have medical aid and stuff like that. So it is that issues of affordability that we need to ensure that we strive, that uh, we ensure that we create this national health insurance in South Africa to cover our people in terms of uh, health services in our country. As a result, the Department of Health, as we speak, they're busy pr making a preparation in building appropriate health facilities so that when the time comes for that health insur insurance to be introduced, uh, we'll be home and dry. All right, so okay, we're going to take a, a quick commercial break and uh, we'll come back, take more questions from the floor. And